whole history of blood libels against the Jews, a whole history of persecution of the Jews by Christians during the Middle Ages. Betrayed by his distinctive clothing which marks him as a Jew, Agamemnon is taken to town officials for questioning. He is not alone, according to 14th century chronicler Jean de Venet. The infection and the sudden death which it brought were blamed on the Jews, who were said to have poisoned wells and rivers and corrupted the air. <laughs> After hours of torture, Agamemnon breaks down. He falsely confesses that a rabbi did give him a pouch filled with venom, which he used to poison the wells. They were forced to confess that no Jews are innocent. All Jews are guilty. They're all part of this conspiracy. And no one can be clear of these charges. Devonet reports that confessions like Agamemnon's fly up and down the Rhine. Accordingly, the whole world brutally rose against them. And in Jewish communities, many thousands were indiscriminately butchered, slaughtered, and burned alive by the Christians. What's poisoning us is the Jews' presence itself. That the Jews' presence is a moral failing. It's our sin to tolerate them. And this is what's bringing this punishment. As Pope Clement VI pointed out at the time, Jews were dying in equal number to Christians. So it was fantastical to argue that Jews were poisoning people during the Black Death. The Pope's pleas fall on deaf ears. On St. Valentine's Day, 1349, the citizens of Strasbourg round up as many as 2,000 Jews and burn them at the stake. The atrocity is repeated in more than 15 cities in Germany and Switzerland. The people of Europe have been poisoned, not by some insidious Jewish plot, but by fear, hate, and ignorance. The lethal combination is spinning out of control even faster than the Black Death. By the autumn, the Black Death has made its way from the Far East and is sweeping over Sicily, leaving panic in its wake. It is a disaster without precedence, as if God himself has deserted his children. In Venice, Agama, the Jewish servant of a Swiss lord, finds all that his master desires. Saffron and cinnamon, silks and furs, and more besides. For late in the year, Merchant ships from the east arrive, bearing a cargo of death. 14th century Italian chronicler Gabriele de Musis gives voice to the horror of the sailors who have unwittingly brought the eastern catastrophe home. To our anguish, we were carrying the thoughts of death. We were spreading a poison from our lips even as we spoke. Of course, they didn't have any idea that the plague was spread by a bacterium, by a microscopic organism that can't be seen by the naked eye. But they did have a, um, a sense and a knowledge that the plague could be spread from person to person. As Agamemnon heads back to Geneva, the world behind him begins to fall apart. Venetians are dying at the astonishing rate of 600 a day. January of 1348, the plague enters France through ships trading at Marseille. It sails over water to Spain. In Barcelona, 
60% of the population perishes. You can imagine a person, let's say a sailor, working in the dock area, being bitten by an infectious flea. They would get on their ship, and then they could travel on their ship. And they wouldn't become sick for, again, two to six days. So there's the potential for people to move around, move from one area to another before becoming ill. Of course, this same ship may have rats with infectious rat fleas, and then when the ship reaches a port, those rats and their fleas can get off and spread their disease as well. By early spring, the Black Death travels up to the mouth of the Rhone River to Avignon, where the Pope resides. Vigneret, je vous en supplie. La maladie frappe à la porte. Doctor. Though Guy de Chaliac urges him to flee, Clement VI reportedly refuses to leave his palace. By August 1348, the plague reaches Paris. Half its population will die. When it lands in Bordeaux, England's Princess Joan is just arriving from her sea journey. She will rest at the family estate for a while, and then continue on to Castile and her prince. Joan is perhaps the most well-guarded woman in Europe right now, but archers and castle walls cannot shield her from an unseen enemy. No, no, no! You can't pass here! No! It's too dangerous for the princess! Like a phantom. The pestilence strikes randomly, wiping out a household, a neighborhood, an entire town. Even before it sows destruction, it breeds terror. There was nothing they could do. And it's that sense of facing an event over which you have absolutely no power that makes it a dr such a dramatic event in human history. I've often tried to imagine what it must have felt like to hear that in the town across the mountains, 75% of the people had just died. And what they did hear, they received letters before the plague came. They knew the plague was coming in many places. So they had time to think about what's gonna happen when it gets here. And I, I can't really imagine uh, a scarier thought. Consumed by fear, Many of the gentry flee the cities, leaving the less fortunate to fend for themselves. What we see in, in literature are these cowardly figures, the, the rich who are going into the countryside and who are, who are there frightened um, by their own mortality. So who's left behind? Who is back in town suffering but the poor and those who are unable to do what the rich can? Edward III and his eldest son retreat to a country estate, bolting the gates behind them. But the wholesome atmosphere does not seem to protect the serfs who farm the land. They die by the droves. In the fields, on the roads, and in their miserable hovels. People lived in, in extreme poverty and they lived in huts uh, with thatched roofs. Uh, and they had livestock living in very close association with them. They had dirt floors to the huts. Uh, the, the, thing, the living conditions were absolutely filthy. In types of environments, we expect rats and rat fleas to proliferate and do quite well. 